This content may not be suitable for all ages. Listener discretion is advised. I thought I must be dreaming. This has to be a nightmare. But I understood quickly my biggest fear had come true. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by. But everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost as if I was leaving my body. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm, and he left his phone on my bed. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Welcome back in, everyone, and thanks for joining me. This week, I'm bringing you four true horrifying tales and a listener voicemail that will keep you on the edge of your seat. So sit back and listen close as we dive into the horror. Now, at the top of the show, I just have one quick thing I want to cover, and that is to thank all of you who have gone out of your way to rate, review, and share the podcast. Now, as an independently produced show, we don't have a huge marketing budget like some of these large podcast companies do. So the three biggest things you can do to help us out is first and foremost, click that follow button in the podcast app of your choice. This ensures that you're locked in and get every new episode right when it drops. Next up is leaving a rating and review. When people are out there searching for new shows to follow, those reviews do help out in attracting new listeners. So if you have a moment, just click that star rating and write us a sentence or two with your thoughts on the show. And finally, just sharing the show with someone you think will enjoy it. Disturbed has spread almost exclusively by word of mouth up to this point, so you guys already do a great job of this, and it's greatly appreciated. But enough of all that. You're here for the stories, so let's get to it. We open the show hearing from Reddit user Mon Kilo, featuring voice work by Tanya E.B. And we have an intruder. I was 23 years old at that time and a student. I was living alone in a small apartment complex, not too far away from my school. I've never liked living alone. I was also afraid of the dark. However, I always felt safe in my little apartment. It only had one way to get in, and you needed to unlock two doors to get inside, the main front door to the building and the door to my apartment. I also used to have a few lights on, even at night, and my laptop was usually playing some movie until I fell asleep. I always locked my door, except this one time. One weekend, I was out drinking with my friends, and when I was going back home, I ended up sharing a taxi with a random guy that was going to the same area as me. We both jumped out of the taxi outside my place and talked for a little while. He was about the same age as me and said he was also a student. He walked me to my front door and we said goodnight and I went inside. Some weeks, maybe a month later, I decided to stay home that weekend. I was just watching some series in bed until I fell asleep. Suddenly, I woke up to a voice. I couldn't really hear what the voice was saying, but I could hear it was a man talking. I opened my eyes. The room was dark, but I could see a shadow standing in the doorway to my bedroom. I froze. My adrenaline started pumping. I couldn't scream, I just kept staring at the figure. I thought I must be dreaming. This has to be a nightmare. But I understood quickly my biggest fear had come true. He stopped talking, and I asked quietly, Who are you? He took a step closer and whispered, Don't you remember me? He was clearly drunk, but I suddenly could see it was the same guy I shared a taxi with some weeks ago. I felt some weird feeling of relief that I recognized him, but at the same time I was horrified. My thoughts started spinning. What did he want? Why was he here? I didn't know what to do. There was no place to hide or run to. My first thought was to try to stay calm, so I just asked quietly what he was doing here. I was thinking about you, he said, and continued. I turned off your lights and closed your laptop. 
He smiled. I kept looking at him. I was still in my bed, still didn't know what to do. I felt sick of the thought of him walking around my apartment while I was sleeping, but decided that I will continue to stay calm. I asked him how he got into my building. He said that he had been ringing my doorbell that I didn't open, so he tried my neighbor's doorbell and someone opened up for him. He also went into my neighbor's apartment but realized it wasn't mine. He then saw my name at the door and went in. I think he could see the fear in my eyes. He suddenly turned around and said, I think I should go. He stumbled out and I went after him. Right before he left, he said, you should really lock your door. I shut the door in his face and locked it. I went back to bed and cried. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I never called the police, but I told my friends the next day. The following months, someone would ring my doorbell every now and then in the middle of the night. I would get an anxiety attack every time. I never opened up, but I had a feeling it could be him. I never saw the guy again. I'm so relieved nothing happened that night, and from this day I always double check that I have locked. I also removed my name from the door. So to this guy, let's not meet again. Are you listening alone? Rather brave of you. Up next, we check in with Reddit user Call Me Jimothy, featuring voice work by Matt Bradford. And we have a truly bizarre encounter. I used to work in a casino. One night I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried to explain where to go, but she insisted I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. And as I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. And she mentioned she was a medium and how her family has always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work in a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and odd people. And I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked her how she knew my sister. Well, she didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in her life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even began to become visibly emotional as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she told me was undeniably accurate and insightful. Then she shifted her focus. See, she told me about someone I worked with and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us and advised me to take caution. At this point, she had lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I started becoming more skeptical again, and reminded her that I needed to get back to work and to keep walking towards our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked, and I began to once again find myself astonished as to not just what she was telling me, but also how she was going about it, her body language, expressions, and emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well and turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum, above my belly button, just below where my ribcage started. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper-aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by. But everything seemed to be in slow motion, almost as if I was leaving my body. It could have only been a few seconds. It could have been 20 minutes. I don't know. But I felt as if I couldn't breathe and weakness in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. The casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt this shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and started apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. 
I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them everything was fine and they walked off. I turned back to the woman, still apologizing, and she said, If you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, but I told her thanks, but I have to go back to work now, and quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I noticeably was completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words and physical sensation. See, I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was far too scared to get medical verification of an ulcer. I had already previously suspected it. It was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time. But if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. The encounter happened nearly 10 years ago, and it has sat with me ever since. But recently I was reflecting back on it. See, I realized that the second part about the coworker that initially made no sense at all all of a sudden did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years ago. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly 7 years to the day from the moment this woman described it to me. And not only were the two incidents separated by 7 years, but the person she described I hadn't even met yet. It was an entirely different state and company. I don't know what to make of this. I've come on this podcast to see what other people's take is. I'm open to this type of stuff, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. I'd love to hear what anyone has to say about it. We need to get rid of some evidence. Don't go anywhere. Now back to the deliciously frightful. Disturbed Podcast with your host, Chad. And now let's check in with a listener of the show, Cassie. She went over to disturbedpodcast.com slash hotline and shared her experience. And we're grateful she did. Take a listen. Hi. My name is Cassie. I've been listening to your podcast for a good while now. I'm constantly running errands in the car, and I'm so tired of listening to music. And honestly, your podcasts are what gets me through the day. And even when I'm at work, I'll listen to them when I'm restocking shelves or anything like that, and there's no customers. But not only did I want to rave about how your podcast is amazing and everything, I also wanted to tell you a creepy story that happened to me uh, a couple months ago, actually. So, I'm a dancer. I work in strip clubs. I do experience a lot of creepy things. A lot of it, I've kind of been really safe and, like, safe and everything to myself. And I've had some really creepy customers that have tried to take me home, that have followed me home, and so forth. Usually I can get out of those situations really fast because I'm very good at indicating when a situation's about to go very bad, very fast. But there's this one particular night that got me into a lot of trouble. So I come into the club, my normal time, it's Saturday night, we're a little busy, girls are making money, I get on the stage and I start making money immediately. But I notice one customer And again, I'm very, very good with telling like, okay, I'm not going to go to that customer. I'm not going to talk to him. If he talks to me, I'm going to pretend that I'm busy. So he comes up to my stage, gives me money. I do a little dancey dance for him. And he asks me to come and sit with him. At this time, I was already in the VIP area with a group of people making enough money to not have to walk around and hustle. So... I get back on stage the like a third time after the first encounter I had with him. And by the time I'm at the third stage, because we have three stages in the club, and the third stage is the last stage, and that's where we all kind of like slack off and sit down and kind of relax before we have to get back up and start walking around. And I'm sitting there, I'm texting, I'm 
putting the dry hands back on, getting ready to stand up and start doing pull tricks. And the guy walks up to me again. And he notices that I have a drink in my hand. And I don't normally drink to get drunk at the club. I just drink to kind of loosen my nerves and able to get that confidence. I'm like the mom. I'll take all the girls home if they're too drunk to drive home. And he goes, look, I really want you to sit with me. I have X amount of money and everything and so forth. I'm like, all right, you know what? Just let me put a cherry on top of the cake. And I was like, okay, I'll come and sit with you. And in my head, I was kind of debating on if I really wanted to or if I just kind of wanted to run in the back and hide for a good couple of minutes. He goes, okay, well, what are you drinking? I see you're drinking something. And I was like, oh, I'm drinking just a Jack and Coke. And that's it. He goes, well, I'll order it for you. And I'm thinking, okay, well, the, the waitress is going to come over and drop it off on the stage like they normally do. She does it. So flags me down and he comes right up to me with my drink and he hands it to me. And normally I would never have taken a drink from a stranger. But that night, I don't know what was going through my head. I don't know why I decided, you know, this is a good idea. So I take the drink and I immediately just, it's in those like little glass bar cl- cups. And I just down it. Not even like a second later, I realized that the drink had a weird taste to it. Like as if someone had put like a drug inside of it or salt or something very like, salty tasting and ironing tasting so i'm sitting with this guy because i start kind of getting a little tired and i'm not understanding why i'm tired because i wasn't drinking enough to feel drunk and pretty much what happens is that he starts going on about how he has how he loves his son how he just got in a divorce how he hasn't felt the touch of a woman in a while so on so on typical shit I hear every day in a club and I'm like oh that's so sad that's so I'm acting like I'm engaged like I really care and I really don't and I just remember him going well do you can I get a dance I have a VIP area and I was like yeah sure that's fine so we stand up getting ready to walk towards the VIP area and I black out I don't remember much all I remember was that I had gotten pulled over and the cop was yelling at me and then i remember waking up inside of a jail cell in the most weirdest positions with my head like it wasn't even pounding it was more of like i just felt sick to my stomach not like a hangover because i'm very wimpy when it comes to hangovers i will cry and you will know i'm hungover but like My head just felt cloudy and clogged and like I couldn't get like anything right. I was very disoriented and I had to throw up so bad. So when I ran to the like the toilet that was in the cell cell room there, I had thrown up foam and it wasn't even like acid foams from your stomach or anything or even the liquor that I had drank in the previous night. It was just straight up foam. I did that a couple of times to the point to where I felt like my stomach was going to come straight out of my mouth. Comes to find out, I had given this guy my Facebook, my number, and everything else. And because of those actions I took that night, I lost a lot of stuff. I lost my actual career job. I lost having privileges over my son and so on. So this is just a little kind of heads up to any of the girls who do want to be in the industry of dancing and all of that jazz. It's not cracked up as it's supposed to be and as everybody makes it sound it to be. It is a hard job and it makes your self-esteem go down sometimes. And if you're not safe, you could get seriously hurt. I'm just lucky that a police officer found me that night instead of that man taking me home. So... That's the moral of my story. And to the guy, whoever slipped something in my drink, I hope we never meet again. Because if we do, you're going to have some fucking mad brothers after you. Thanks, Cassie. And yet another reminder to be as aware as possible, especially as a woman in a bar. 
a situation that can quickly go from fun to terrifying before you even realize it. Thanks again for sharing. Are you terrified yet? You will be. Now next up, we hear from Reddit user The Beady Bunch, featuring voice work by Nicole Doolin. And we find ourselves in a situation that could have ended very badly. So this happened in 2011, so the exact dialogue may have escaped my memory a bit. But the situation is something I'll never forget. Also, AIM was still pretty active during this time, and so was video chatting. Think tiny chat. This is important for later. I was on an online dating site and was talking to this guy. I was 31 at the time, he was 28. We talked for six weeks before I gave him my phone number, and we took it offline to calling and texting for another couple of weeks. Two months after our initial chat, we were texting, and he told me that he was out having a few beers at a bar near my house. He asked what I was doing and asked if I wanted to come out. But I had a very long day at work and didn't feel like going to a bar. I'm also not a big drinker. I invited him over to my place. I know, I know. After he finished at the bar and he accepted. I figured I would be okay since I do keep firearms for protection and know how to defend myself if needed. I also had a webcam. I took a shower so I wouldn't smell like a water buffalo on a hot day. The air went out at work. Put on some makeup and got dressed to wait. He then called and said he was outside of my house. I clicked record on my computer's webcam program and turned off my monitor and went to let him in. It's around 10 p.m. and he comes in and we go back to my bedroom because my living room was being remodeled. We're sitting on the bed chatting for about an hour, talking about everything under the sun. The conversation flowed. He was very handsome and so easy to be comfortable with. We got on the subject of firearms and I showed him mine. About 15 minutes later, he asked for some water. So I go to the kitchen to get him a bottle. When I came back, he said he got a phone call and had to leave. After he left, I looked on my nightstand, where I put the firearm down after showing him, and noticed that it was gone. I looked everywhere for it, thinking I had put it down somewhere else. Nope, not there. I then played back the recording from my webcam program, and sure enough, it shows him grabbing it and putting it in his hoodie. I was terrified at that point. He knew where I lived. He had my firearm, and he left his phone on my bed. Right then, his phone rings, and I answer it. Come to find out, he's married. His wife was calling him, wondering where he was. I told her everything, including the fact that he stole my firearm, and I had video evidence, and was calling the police on him. Next thing I know, he's banging on my door my firearm in his hand, asking me for his phone. The conversation went like this. Him. I need my phone. Give me my phone. Me. Not opening the door, but yelling through the window. Take the clip out of my firearm. Empty the chamber. Throw the clip into the bushes, the one in the chamber across the road, and put it on the ground. Him. No. Give me my phone. Me. I'm on the phone with your wife at the moment, and I have you on video stealing from me. I put his wife on speaker. Wife. A whole bunch of expletives. Him. Looking like a shocked Pikachu. He runs and gets in his car, then comes back. I threw your gun in the ditch. At this point, I make him empty his pockets. Take his pants off. Take his hoodie off and show me that he doesn't have my firearm on him. All the while, his wife is on the phone. I go outside and get in his car, in the driver's seat, and tell him to take me to where he threw my firearm. He proceeds to tell me that I don't know how hard it is for him, being a felon, not being allowed to own a firearm ever because of a mistake he made. The mistake? Domestic violence. Involving a firearm. 
We get up the road. He tells me the firearm is there in the ditch. Then I realize the situation I'm in. I can get out of the car and go get it, leaving him to do whatever to me if he chose. He was 6'4", 225 pounds. Me, 5'3", 135 pounds at the time. Or I could make him go get it, taking a chance of him seriously hurting me. I took that chance since I was on his phone with his wife and my phone with 911. He retrieves my firearm, brings it back to the car, and I drive back to my house and wait on the police. I get out of the car and he gets in the driver's seat. I'm still on the phone with the police. I walk around the back of his car to get his license plate number, and he just puts his car in reverse, hits me, and takes off. They found him later that evening. He still had the clip and the one in the chamber in his pocket. So now he's enjoying time in prison. So glad I never have to meet this person again. Do you have your own terrifying encounter? Did something unexplained happen to you? Let us know and get featured on the podcast. Email my story at disturbedpodcast.com. Hi, my name is Lily. I'm listening from Alaska and I listen to your podcast every single day. Keep up the good work. And finally, we close out the show hearing from Reddit user Female Cactus, featuring voice work by Danuta Marie. And we just barely survive. I'm a 19 year old female French student, so please excuse my English. This event happened last week. I was heading to my apartment after seeing a friend. I took the tram at 11.30 p.m. because I didn't feel comfortable walking at night. As soon as I sat, a man who was already sitting nearby came and sat in front of me. I had a very strange feeling about it as I told my boyfriend by chat. Then, I stood up to get out of the tram, but the man quickly got out after me. He was weirdly following me, not walking behind me, but next to me. I was getting very anxious, knowing something was wrong. So I continued to walk to the avenue I live on. I crossed the road and he didn't, so I thought it was okay. But a few seconds after, he crossed the road too and was walking behind me. Then he passed me and was walking in front of me. So I thought I was just getting paranoid and that he was just walking this way too. But near my building, he stopped and waited until I met him. He asked me if I had a boyfriend and all. I answered, yes, sorry, good evening, as polite as I could be. He proceeded to leave in front of me, so I was walking slower for him to be far from me and to make sure he didn't know I was almost home. I turned into the little pathway heading to the lobby of my building, but I was still anxious about this man, even though he continued to walk. I thought I had put my keys in my pocket, but they were in my bag. I was shaking so much that I tried multiple times to grab them. I managed to get them and I opened the magnetic door, but thought of closing the door immediately after me in case the man wanted to follow me. The door was closed, but the magnetic system wasn't on yet, so the man was running to it and pushed it violently with the horrific eyes looking at me. The door is made of glass, so I totally saw him. That's when I knew I was getting into real trouble. So without even thinking, I screamed as much as I could, and I think that's what saved my life. Immediately, the man ran to me, pushed me hard on the ground, and started to choke me really hard. I was too stunned because I wasn't prepared for such a violent assault. While he was choking me, I couldn't scream at all or even breathe and nobody was coming, so I really thought I was going to die, looking at his bulging eyes staring directly into mine with pure hate. I'm small, so I wasn't able to do anything with my arms at all. I think it wasn't that long, but it felt like an eternity and I lost consciousness for a moment. When I opened my eyes again, he had just run out and I saw the caretaker's wife beside me. The caretaker was chasing after the man, but didn't manage to get him. He came back and called the police. They caught the man within 10 minutes thanks to our description. I really don't know why he did that to me, because when he attacked me, 
He didn't sexually assault me or rob me, which would have been easy. I can't understand that his only goal was to kill. I'll never be thankful enough to my caretaker who came to help me and save my life because nobody else in the building called the police or even tried to help. The man was judged three days later and is in jail now, but he denied everything, even when me and the caretaker identified him, and there is video proof of him following me. So to the man that tried to kill me, let's not meet again. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. Don't forget to head over to disturbedpodcast.com slash submit to send in your own true terrifying tale. Disturbed is produced by yours truly, funded through advertising and your support. And if you'd like to support the show, you can get early access to our premium feed featuring ad-free listening and bonus episodes. Visit patreon.com slash disturbed podcast to learn more. And let's shout out our newest supporters. Seja Anderson, Carla, Emily R., Victoria Rosa, S21, Leanne King, Brittany, Brennan Fitzwater, Avery Weir, Brooke Brem, Jamie, and Matthew Hyatt. They all get instant access to our catalog of bonus episodes, ad-free listening, and 24-hour early episode releases, and you can too, over at patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast. Music by Carl Casey at WhiteBat Audio and Co.ag. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all. <laughs>